Hi, this is your host Sapna Bharatiya and welcome to another episode of TFI Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Liam Randall, CEO of Cosmonic. Liam, it's great to have you on the show. It's so wonderful to be on the show again. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Me too. Uh, we had a conversation about Cosmic Cloud earlier as well, uh, but it's always good to refresh the memories of our viewers. Tell us quickly, uh, what is Wasm Cloud all about? Sure. Uh, Wasm Cloud is a cloud native computing foundation project. So it's a part of the same foundation that hosts things uh, such as Kubernetes um, uh, that helps developers to build software that can seamlessly oper operate across clouds, edges, um, even their own. And if I'm not wrong, uh, you folks uh, contributed uh, Wasm Cloud to CNCF uh, last summer. Uh, talk a bit about uh, what kind of adoption you have seen of the project. Uh, sure. You know, over the last year, Wasm Cloud has absolutely um, uh, grown. It's grown over 10 times the number of core contributors than we had when we entered um, the CNCF. Um, and we saw that momentum coming was actually one of the driving reasons uh, that drove us to looking for a forum like the CNCF that gives us shared and transparent governance where stakeholders from a variety of different companies and organizations can come together to collaborate on solving shared problems. And in this case, um, you know, our core contributors and developers, you know, went from uh, maybe a dozen or, you know, under 20 core developers to where we are today, which is somewhere around 120. Uh, major contributions have come from folks like Intel uh, and BMW, who contributed a whole machine learning framework um, uh, for Wasm Cloud. Um, and what it essentially does is it lets organizations use uh, the powerful Wasm Cloud framework and now operate uh, machine learning models across diverse clouds, diverse edges, um, and diverse equipment. Uh, can you also talk about uh... What is driving this adoption of Wasm Cloud? Uh, when I'm talking about, I'm not talking specific uh, companies, yeah. but the the whole, you know, the way folks are uh, creating and deploying uh, applications. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when we think about, you know, maybe the last, you know, 30 years of tech, you know, there have been waves of architecture that have come along with the strategic priorities of companies. Like, you know, back in the 90s, the theme was digitize everything. And we saw the rise of, uh, you know, CDW, Dell, you know, people that were building uh, data centers. And uh, with virtualization, we really saw this dawn of this era that's, that we've ridden over the last 15 years, the great lift and shift. Let's um, reduce complexity, let's accelerate innovation, um, let's start adopting services and technologies that allow us to digitize things faster. And um, now we're sort of at this pivotal moment, though. As organizations have started to build out successful applications and digital footprints, they're faced with another concern, which is uh, this rise of distributed software and the rise of distributed architectures. And when we think about that strategically, what that means is um, while the last 15 years we've been building sort of key transit points and data centers to host our code, the theme that's dominating um, software architecture moving forward is, is how do we bring the compute towards the edges? Um, and when we say edges, you know, we mean a globally diverse population that includes different public cloud providers. Um, um, some of this is driven by technology. Some of this is driven by a regulation, but it's all driven by a common desire to give our users a better, more responsive experience and to start enriching those experiences um, with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, can you also talk about when we look at uh, Wasm Cloud or um, typically, uh, any open source project, of course, there is fully open source project that anybody can go and start using. But uh, the limitation is that, uh, first of all, it's a project driven by the community. So every community member is kind of a stakeholder. So sometimes what happens is that uh, a lot of commercial features, they don't get into that because few customers want that and la larger community may not want or need that. Then you also may need support. Community members, they can do only so much. They cannot be on phone calls helping folks out there. Um, then also you need day to over update, patching, all those things happen. So can sure. you talk, also talk about that aspect of Wasm Cloud Third point is that in the cloud world, you know, once again, uh, there when we talk about community or ecosystem, there are different players. You know, vendors are there who offer it as SaaS. Somebody will offer it that you can install it yeah. on your on-prem. So, can you just talk about the whole ecosystem there as well? Absolutely. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about um, is the, the open source core, um, uh, which is what Wasm Cloud, you know, really represents. Now, Wasm Cloud is designed in a way. Um, to sort of enable and scale communities. You know, when we think about even the way the application is architected, I have 
have this theory that all really good software is pluggable. You know, by design, you can extend Wasm Cloud without rebuilding all of the custom components um, uh, or the application. And what that means is, is that organizations that have unique requirements or requirements they want to keep confidential, um, they don't even have to contribute those things back to the community. They can just maintain their own proprietary plugins. Luckily and fortunately, we have lots of very generous community, uh, community members that believe in the power of open source, that open source uh, produces fundamentally better software because it's tested against different use cases in different deployment contexts. And it gets the advantage of the shared thinking and concerns from a tremendously large and diverse community. You know, there are, there are people in our community that run Wasm Cloud on Kubernetes um, in lockdown FedRAMP context. There are people that are running Wasm Cloud for hobby projects. There are people that run Wasm Cloud in their BMWs, for example, like BMW, they use Wasm Cloud for quality assurance um, and running machine learning models that they can run on their edge, on their own hardware, in their BMWs, on their developer workstations, and inside their own clouds as well. So I think that when we think about the core purpose, the community itself is very successful. I mean, it's designed in a way um, so that the common shared components of the engine um, to scale workloads, to update workloads, to deploy workloads, are all uh, baked into the ecosystem. So I think there is clear scope. And when we think about what separates what would be an open source from what would be in a platform as a service um, offered as a SaaS, which is what Cosmonic builds around Wasm Cloud, uh, the company that I'm CEO of, um, there's clear definition and scope there. Um, uh, where you know the um, the sort of core functionality, the core algorithms that help you to drive and scale your workloads are part of the open core. But when we think about you know the user interface or automation or multi-cloud workflows or integration into external third-party services like SSO, for example, all of those things are provided uh, commercially because those are um, uh, you know hard to support when you're thinking about those in an open source community context. I think your last question was, you know, what's, what about the day two um, for both the open source um, and for uh, Cosmonic? I think the day two experience for Wasm Cloud is intentionally very strong. You know, we invested very heavily as a community in automation um, and in, uh, you know, the creation of a seamless developer experience. You know, we um, are constantly um, with 120 committers to our contributors to the core. We're constantly rolling out new features and um, performance improvements and capabilities on a weekly basis. This week, for example, we unveiled distributed tracing um, in Wasm Cloud, which is baked into every single platform. Now that's the technology. It really functions, though, as a plugin. To use it, you can plug it into open source things like Grafana Tempo for distributed tracing, or Honeycomb.io for distributed tracing, or Datadog for distributed tracing. And so I think the day two experience is very strong. And then, of course, for folks that want an even higher level of support, there are companies like Cosmonic in our community that help us to build, run, and scale those workloads in a bit uh, more automated fashion. Did that address the uh, questions around open source and open source core? No, it did. I mean, you, I mean, you explained basically, you know, the the typical open source model and also, you know, how the most important thing, as you mentioned, and also the data is very strong because of the automation. So that's that's really great. I also want to talk, quickly talk about the security aspect there because security is becoming a very serious topic today. Yeah, I think that folks that are looking, um, that are riding this wave of distributed software, one of their first concerns is security. And, um, you know, Wasm Cloud is an application framework that's built on the new standard um, out of the W3C uh, around WebAssembly. And WebAssembly by design is incredibly secure. Um, it starts as, if you think about what this is as a technology, you know, WebAssembly is a, a very similar promise to what you've heard before. Write once, run anywhere. And um, logically think of it though as a virtual CPU for an individual application. So this virtual CPU is already running in all of your common web browsers and uh, device platforms. It runs on Intel servers, it runs on ARM servers, it runs on uh, edge devices, Amazon Prime uses this virtual WebAssembly CPU to support over 8,000 unique television operating system combinations. So this uh, diverse, uh, this CPU is very powerful. And one of its chief things that it does is it gives you a little virtual sandbox. So by design, all of your workloads that you're running in WebAssembly are locked down. They're both um, contained uh, and they're also uh, reactive. 
Um, that's the first thing. The second thing that WebAssembly gives us um, out of the standard is, is that it starts as deny by default. So it's um, a capability-driven system. So out of the box, you can't do things like open files or access folders, even if there were some sort of vulnerability that enabled it. You have to specifically grant access to files, to folders, to cameras, to network devices, and so forth in order to get things going. That's where WebAssembly leaves off, and our framework Wasm Cloud picks up from there and adds even additional layers of security. Every single artifact that you pull in um, needs to be signed um, and attested for, um, as well as any additional use of higher order services. So to use things like a SQL server or a database or a file store in the Wasm Cloud framework, you have to have a security ticket in order to do so. And if you don't have it, I'm sorry, but there's no access granted. Everything's denied by default. Excellent. Uh, you, 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 earlier you were talking about, uh, when you're talking about the committee, you also talk, when you're talking about the adoption, you're talking about you know, Adobe and all those things. Can you share some unique use cases, not the typical use cases that you see of Wasm Cloud that you yourself are not only excited about it, but you're, oh wow, they are using it in this capacity. It's, you know, it's one of those things that I truly, my whole career has been, um, you know, a serial entrepreneur that's primarily worked on open source business models. And I worked on Brozeek out of Berkeley, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and then I was the first Kubernetes company in 2014 with Critical Stack. Uh, I was the seed investor in OS Query. And the one thing that I've always appreciated and admired across all of these open source projects is um, how the diverse community continues to surprise, uh, to surprise and delight even the creators of the software. You know, when we imagined Wasm Cloud, um, it was me and a team of developers inside of Capital One that were looking to solve what we felt were our biggest um, long-term enterprise challenges in software architecture. And in many ways, software architecture is destiny because how you build your applications sort of defines how you maintain them. How do you update them? Um, how do you scale them? And we sat down and we worked on this problem, but we've just been constantly surprised. Adobe pulled us onto a call um, and they've talked about this publicly. They spoke um, about this at the very last, most recent KubeCon EU, and I believe they'll be speaking at KubeCon US as well, um, where they talked about how they were taking microservices that they were running on the back end and they were able to push those microservices down into customers' web browsers. So when you think about what that means from an architecture point of view, it was good, it was the same algorithm, it was faster uh, because it gave, um, instead of uploading pictures to a third-party data center and then downloading the um, updated pictures back, you were able to do it all on the edge. So the deployment or the operation time dropped to 40 milliseconds from over 400 milliseconds, and it was cheaper because you were able to tape take application functionality and push it down to the applications, uh, uh, to the user's browser, they had also offloaded the cost of operating and running those microservices. So when we saw that, we had this fundamental insight that, you know, Wasm Cloud is part of a trend that can even start to unlock new diverse um, business models, because you can now have business models that are driven on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, or business models that are, um, uh, you know, operated on a, a basis or intention where the users are, you know, a key um, 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 processors of some of the workloads. Um, so those were um, all very interesting. Um, I think the second example I would cite would be the work that Intel and, and BMW have been leading. They first turned to Wasm Cloud because they um, wanted to build very complex distributed software architectures that were dynamic, where they could change the topology at runtime instead of understanding what it would be at start time or design time. And one of the features that they felt that they needed uh, was the ability to operate TensorFlow models on the edge um, or in the cloud. And um, they added support for both TensorFlow and Microsoft Onyx um, as capability providers into Wasm Cloud. So the whole community now can take advantage of those and use those. And it's just so exciting. I know that as we continue to grow this community, as we continue to build this community, and the community gets more and increasingly diverse, we're going to have users that are doing things we never even imagined um, were possible. Uh, it's an open source project. Folks can you know go and check it out. But uh, can you also talk about what are the things that you folks are uh, working on? Not necessarily share the whole pipeline or roadmap or you know what is the future look like, but just give us a kind of a glimpse of what are the things that you folks are going to work on or working on. Yeah, you know, we're continuing to really focus on the developer experience. And the reason for that is, is that, you know, many um, software architectures and applications are driven 
um, largely by that developer experience. You know, it's not just what does it cost to create applications, but what does it cost to scale them? What does it cost to maintain them? And those costs um, can be dramatic in software architectures where we're taking lots of outside components like Log4j and bringing them into each and every application. So we're really focused around the improvements that help our developers um, to automate those uh, workflows faster. Um, and as we continue um, to build out over the next few months, um, I would really invite everybody uh, in um, your community and watching at home to get involved. Uh, you know, you can visit us at wasmcloud.com and join our weekly community meetings every Wednesday. You can uh, single click, um, add yourself to our Slack and just ask and learn more. We offer live labs at labs.cosmonic.com where you can simply click through. And of course, we'll be at KubeCon NA in Detroit uh, this year for both WebAssembly Day and for the main session. And uh, we're still on the uh, com com I'm also still the chair of uh, Cloud Native WebAssembly Day. Um, and we are absolutely, absolutely still taking submissions for anyone at home that's doing anything interesting with Wasm Cloud or in WebAssembly in general. would love to come on and share what they're working on. Liam, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about not only Wasm Cloud, uh, the company, but the whole you know ecosystem around it. That's more important for open source project. Also, the the way it's being embraced and adopted in so many unique ways. So, thank you for sharing all of those. And uh, I would love to have you back on the show, or maybe we'll see each other again at KubeCon. Thank you. You know, we should find some time at KubeCon to hang out, and uh, maybe we can do a session live from the floor. <laughs> <laughs>